Okay, so uh, welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining us. Pod Chat Live episode 80. And we're doing something just a little bit different uh, this month in that we'd normally do one a month and they last about an hour. But because uh, this topic was proving popular, because there was a sort of subtopic associated with coronavirus associated with it, we split them into two episodes and we're doing them back to back. So tonight is episode 80 and we're delighted to welcome uh, Joseph to, to talk to us about him. We'll introduce him shortly. Uh, tomorrow night, if you want to join us, off the back of tonight's foundation, Foundation, where we're going to talk everything about chill blains and what they are and what how they manifest tomorrow night um, we are going to sort of take on board the topic of their their associations or manifestations with coronavirus so join us for that as well but tonight we have joseph uh, or tonight for me this morning 5 a.m for, for you guys um we have joseph uh, from melbourne uh, let me just glance at my notes so i don't uh, do him a disservice professional diploma in dermatology um master's degree in wound healing and tissue repair um I've already apologised to him off air for being a complete amateur and novice in this topic. And these questions are going to be incredibly simple. And he's going to bat them away with ease. This nearly didn't happen. We had a, we had a, or he had a dental emergency in the last 20, 24 hours. And we thought we were going to have to cancel. Luckily, we didn't. He saw the dentist. It's all fixed. We're, we're open game for making dental jokes. We can get our teeth stuck into some dental puns. That's my first one out there. Um, so anyone watching... Anyone watching at any time, fire away with questions um, that you have as we go. Fire, fire away with your best toothache dental-based puns. Um, but yeah, Joseph, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to this one. It's, it's clearly a, a topic that I didn't really appreciate how much of an appetite there was for it, how, how much um, people wanted to hear about it. Um, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to get, get stuck in with, with the, the sort of list of questions we've got, if that's okay. We'll just, we'll just yeah. uh, fire yeah, off. Yeah, absolutely. Away far off by saying um what we want to do by the end is have the listeners have the audience comfortable with what the what observations uh, what manifestations clinically they see with a chill brain a bit of underlying knowledge about what it is what's going on at a physiological level perhaps the demographic of people uh, it it may be more prone in um you know and the management ultimately so we'll, we'll start sure. with the obvious i guess opener which is could you just give us uh, the the basic uh, definition of what a chill brain is yes uh, good morning good afternoon good evening i feel like um uh truman burbank in the truman show wherever you're listening <laughs> um and it's funny that uh just before i begin that this is episode 80 and i felt like an 80 year old when my tooth actually uh, fell out biting into a piece of garlic bread which of course my wife thought was a dig at her but it was it was quite tasty um so often when it comes to most medical conditions and particularly dermatological ones a lot is in the actual name so um in my research for this you, you start to look into the the actual definition so if you break down chill blame, it's actually two words. Chill obviously means cold, something my kids say to me a lot, Dad, just chill. And blame means inflamed sore. It comes from the old English word blegen, which means sore. But you'll, you'll notice that there's a synonym for chill blains often called pernio. Pernio comes from the Latin word um, perna, which is actually a reference to pink flesh, like from a pig. Um, so basically it, it means that it's, it's – the, the, the easiest definition is it's a cold sore. So basically it's it's a cold induced vascular injury that manifests in the skin. That's probably the simplest way to describe it. Yeah. So that that, that would be the definition of a chill brain. Perfect. And it's clinical manifestations. Some, uh, you know, we, we, I'm sure you've got some images that you're going to share, but it's clinical manifestations. So if we are in clinic, and I know, um, speaking as someone who isn't particularly comfortable with dermatology, if in my sports injury clinic, if someone comes in and says, while I'm here, what do you think of this skin rash or skin discoloration? Give us a few of the, the observations or, or, or sort of signs that we'd see that may, may hint to us or may flag up to us. Okay, maybe we're in chill blame t territory here. So a lot of it, a lot of it's not just the visual, but also the history. So, for example, if, if you think of something like tinea, tinea normally doesn't pop up, you know, within a day or two. And, and it's not normally acutely itchy. So a lot of it's a lot of it's just based on the history and the symptoms. So it's and, and it's almost always precipitated by a cold and or damp event. And the two together 
tend to precipitate that. But, you know, normally it's it's localised. I mean, depending on the exposure to the cold, it's normally localised to the exposed areas. So you don't normally see, you know, a chill blain in the middle of the calf, for example. You know, you, normally we're talking the extremities. So fingers, toes, ears, noses, um, you know, parts of the body that have relatively thin tissue and that are exposed to cold, wet areas. So, and normally what you'll see is it basically looks like an angry, uh, concentrated um, red sore, almost like almost like a, a, an acute blister that ha- that doesn't necessarily have fluid in it. So, it's like a like a like a small focal red patch. Probably it's probably easiest now for those that are that are joining us live and actually online for me to share my screen so I can actually show you uh, some pictures of some chill blains that I have. Okay, so if you can see that, I, I, I can't actually show the images um, in their full capacity. I apologize. Some of the um, some of the the close ups are actually taken with my dermatoscope, and what's interesting is uh, for those that are uh, fashion conscious. And also those who deal somewhat, in fact, all of us foot people, you can probably tell pretty quickly the image in the middle. So the the first three running um, top left to middle uh, to top middle to top right, that's all the same individual. And that's and that's an elderly person. Now, you can see there's there's some concurrent tinea pedis there as well. Uh, Sorry, some monochromycosis as well. Um, But um, it's important to also note the typical age groups that it manifests in. So the the top left three images are an elderly individual and the rest of them are the same individual, but it's a young individual. So another perhaps dental reference there, it's young and old, really. That's really where you'll typically see chillblains, young and old. And there tends to be a high proportion of um, um, females who have chillblains. There's a few theorized um, reasons why. But that's that's also why I think chillblains is quite an interesting topic, and and, and I'm sure Craig will, will delve on that later. Maybe uh, Craig might even want to discuss, um, you know, beetroot juice at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, just while you while you were talking there, Joseph, it just actually remind me. I don't know whether you ever recall. God, it was might have been. It was over 30, 40 years ago. It was a case series. I think it was in the New Zealand Medical Journal on chillblains in the hands on those mm. who milk cows. Mm. Do you remember that? that you, yeah, no, because no, they were no, going I, from the the, yeah. the hand milking of cows. They were going from the warm um, teats on the cow to the cold in the cold air in the morning when they're milking the cow. And it was, it was <laughs> don't laugh in. This was actually quite a serious <laughs> series. I, I was enjoying. I was enjoying that. that. <laughs> well, that's, that's how you milk cows. <laughs> you, can, you can milk anything with nipples. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So. So if you, if, you, if you just reference back to those images, you know, you're looking at a sort of bright red, sometimes scabby, um, or, you know, um, irritated area. I mean, the, the, if you have a look at um, the ones on, on that young girl, she'd be, about, she'd be about 12, 13. I mean, you can see it's, it's not quite tinea. There's no, you know, it's not really into digital. It's mostly on the tips. And that's also another um, giveaway when it comes to chill blades. You know, you won't normally see it into digitally. It won't have a, a tinea kind of appearance. And unlike unlike eczema and unlike psoriasis, you, you won't – initially you probably won't see a crust or a scab at the later stage because the way the vascular injury works as, as, the, uh, as it progresses and it takes its course, which we'll talk about in just a moment, that's when it starts to get a kind of scabby wound kind of appearance. So – Ultimately, uh, um, the treatment depends on where, which stage it's at. Um, and so often by the time someone comes to see you, it may be on its way out, uh, which, which may also be a lead into your next question, Ian. Um, but, yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I'm preempting everything. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I actually had a quick follow-up question based on your comment. Obviously, this is a podiatry podcast, so we're, we're foot bias. But it's interesting. We note that you know the extremities, the the feet, the fingers, the nose, the ears. Is it common that it would manifest in multiple locations, or would it? But so, if we saw a lesion on the foot, would it be worthy of taking a glance at the the fingers, the ears, the nose, and would, should we expect to see them there concurrently? Uh, it depends on the case. Mo- mostly not. Mostly, it, it tends to be isolated to 
probably in order, I would say it probably goes feet, hands, and then the other extremities. Well, it depends on your location. And it also depends on what the patient's been doing. Um, down under in Australia and, and New Zealand, we're, we're in, in the middle of winter, well, we're at the start of winter. So this might be something you'd see um, in the next month or two. And it also depends on, on how they've been exposed. So if they've gone for a massive, you know, ski weekend or something like that, and then they come back with these, that makes sense. But yeah, mo most of the time in my experience, it, it, I, I mostly see it in the feet. But again, that's because that's what we deal with. So it may be a case of it was in their hands, but they didn't think to mention it to you or they went to their GP or it's taken its natural course already. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's definitely worthwhile in, in a dermatological sense. Certainly there's a number of conditions that are what we call palmo plantar, so of the palm and, and of the soul. And um, we, we sort of group these extremities. We call them acral lesions. So something that's, you know, on the extremity, you know, there tends to be clusters of, of um, you know, similarities. Perfect. Yeah. So let's let's just talk a bit about uh, the history again. We know it's king, as you've already said. So we we don't don't just have our, our sort of visual observations, and you've described them beautifully there as to how they look. We've we've got flags or alarms that, that are raised within ourselves if we uh, we said if the female the female sex that's that's more of a risk. The the sort of history of some kind of exposure to cold and or damp. Um, I recall reading somewhere about low body mass index as well. Could you speak to that briefly? I, I wonder whether that's just a, a basic physical um, manifestation and which is probably why it affects those three groups because they would probably be the lowest in weight and therefore they would have the least amount of insulation. So I wonder whether the thermodynamics of, you know, skinnier people feel the cold more. Unlike myself, I've never felt the cold. <laughs> so I think I think that's probably it. I mean, I have seen chill blains on overweight people, and equally, it's not as if every person who's underweight is going to get it. But I, I would imagine that's probably part of it. Um, I th uh, um, again, and, and, and chill blains and, and and Craig, I'm sure will will jump onto this later. The, the sort of the evidence and the anecdotes around it, and even even when you look deeper into the literature. The people that are researching it, they admit themselves there's not a whole bunch of information out there. And, I, and I'm referring specifically to things like anemia. So particularly in the older population, as well as in the female population, um, anemia can be relatively common. And so the way that, that the body responds to injuries and, and the way the actual um, hemodyn hemodynamics and the way the actual circulation works is altered in someone who's anemic. So um, that could be, yeah, sorry, Craig. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think with some of these medical conditions like anemia, SLE, those, um, even COVID-19, in which th that they are reasonably more common, it's all to do with vascular reactivity and how the Correct. vascular, the microcirculation responds. So they yeah. may not be part of the pathophysiology of, the, of that disease, but they, the pathophysiology of that, that disease affects the peripheral vascular reactivity, which is the, 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 probably the, the mechanism or the link there here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's about the response ultimately. I mean, we all respond, everybody responds. They've, they've done some research into uh, vasospasticity, which by the way, this, this is the umbrella term for things like chill blains and Raynaud's. I never know how to pronounce Raynaud's because I know it's a French word. Raynaud's, Raynaud's. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably get corrected on that from a French person. Um, but, you know, va um, I, I, I was under the impression that vasospasticity means that the blood vessels are opening and closing, but, but most of the time it's a reference basically to a temporary form of vasoconstriction. Mm. So vasoconstriction... Um, basically just means the blood vessels just close. So it, it's normal and it's a natural phenomena in response to some sort of stimulus. In this case, the thermoreceptors, which means cold. And so it's, it's just a matter of how extensive that vasospasm slash constriction is, how long it lasts for, whether the tissues themselves can cope with that, and then um, how that literally manifests into the skin. So it's almost like the sequence is basically you've got an external neurological stimulus, which then causes an, an autonomic, an automatic, basically, um, vascular response, which then leads to dermatological manifestations. So, and dermatology as a whole, what's quite interesting is if you look at it, a lot of it um, is based on 
the way the skin responds to something external. And the foot itself is, is, is I, and I think this is probably why feet are the most susceptible, uh, perhaps, to chillblains, is because feet are their own unique microenvironment. So if you think about cold and damp, if you're wearing a pair of rubbish shoes and or you've got sweaty socks, you've got that perfect external, extrinsic environmental stimulus to create the chillblain environment. Similarly, like tinea, for example. Tinea, you see it in shod populations because of that unique microenvironment. You've got that breakdown of tissue more readily and therefore you've got an external driver for something that then becomes internal, so to speak. Yeah. So, but, but Joseph, my, my, my understanding of the pathophysiology is that it's not actually the cold that causes it. It's the warming up after it gets cold. Correct. And so you're, Correct. you're getting the cold, you're getting the, the normal vascular closing, then the tissues warm up and there's an increased demand for circulation, but because of the vascular reactivity issues, it, it doesn't happen. So, so the, the way I often describe it to patients, well, no, it's not the cold causing it, it's warming up too quickly after you get cold. <laughs> Correct. Um, Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The cold. The cold's actually quite interesting for those uh, for those biochemistry nerds because I was I was looking into this a little bit deeper. There's something called cryoproteins. Mm -hmm. So basically, blood as a whole is is a mixture of, of different cells and, and and different constituents, and proteins are part of it. And so um, cryoproteins and and cryoagglutinins and cryofibrinogen and all these fancy words. Basically, when, when, when the temperatures get too low, the proteins change shape and, the, and they form. And so what uh, they found in a few pediatric cases, particularly with the history of rheumatoid arthritis, familiar history with, with rheumatoid arthritis and with, with lupus, they found that cryoproteins were present in chillblain sufferers. So some have theorized that maybe that could be a, a mechanism. So, so not necessarily just the reperfusion side of things. Maybe the cryoproteins themselves can irritate the vasculature. But yeah, the, the reperfusion part of it is quite right. And, and that leaks into what we were saying before about that, the, the um, vasospasticity, which then ultimately leads to vasodilation. And so as the blood flows back, if the blood vessels themselves have been damaged and inflamed, that means that um, the vasculature gets irritated even further. And, and so if, the, if, if you've got a blood vessel, sorry, I'm just trying to get my hands in the middle of the camera. If you've got a blood vessel that's been, that's been damaged and torn apart, then as it dilates, it starts to open up. And then a lot of those um, constituents of blood, sometimes the cryoproteins, most of the time it's the leukocytes themselves, the white blood cells that leak out into the, the, the dermal um, areas in, in, into the dermis and, and ultimately into the epidermis and they're the ones that do the damage. If you if you jump onto Dermnet and you look at the uh, histopathology of perniosis, they show images of, of, of what um, chillblain tissue looks like and you can actually see leukocytes that have leaked out into the tissue that cause that irritation. So, yeah, so it's it, it, there's a number of pathways. And you're quite right, Craig. It's, you know, yeah. and it's not clear cut. And some people kind of jump steps, you know. Sure. Um, actually, just, just a quick comment. You used a big word then that people who didn't, who fell asleep during their undergraduate lectures probably have forgotten that the perniosis is another name for chillblains. But yes. that would have been yes. taught at the undergraduate level and if, if people aren't aware. Um, look, we just yeah. had a, a question from Nadia, who's our guest on tomorrow's Podchat Live, talking about COVID-19 <laughs> and chillblains. So N Nadia's just raised an interesting point here. Would chillblains not be a cause of a, well, a microaneurysm or a bursting of the capillaries, ultimately causing the subdermal blister formation, which kind of makes yes. sense. It does. It does. Yeah. It's, it, it, the vascu vascular injury takes a lot of forms. So either it's the vasospasmal constriction that's damaged it and then the cryoproteins thereafter, or it's the reperfusion with, with an already damaged structure. So yeah, uh, ultimately it's, it's, it's one form or another. Um, I was going to make a point as well for risk groups. Um, smokers are a, um, a high risk category because as we know smoking naturally causes vasoconstriction mm. and so um if you're in a already vasoconstricted state you're much more likely to have vascular damage and interestingly enough um smoking um forms here's more biochemistry nerdiness for you uh, smoking causes something called advanced glycation end products which is also something we see in, in diabetics as well so that would also probably be another 
um, category for risk factors, also because of peripheral neuropathy, the way they respond to things. But basically, these adv- AGEs, these advanced glycation end products, are proteins that stick to different tissues. So in, in a diabetic, you'd see AGEs in, um, in, in neurovascular structures. And so if you've already got micro and macro vascular damage, then you'd, you'd be at a greater risk for chill blains and reperfusion injuries and vascular injuries. I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, but to me, but to me, smoking also affects vascular reactivity. So it causes the, increases the risk of vasoconstriction, but also increases the risk for the inadequate response to changes in temperatures because of the, that, that reactivity issue. Yes. Joseph, and, and, yeah, don't, apologize, sorry, don't, uh, apologize, don't apologize for talking. This is this show's about you, by the way. Just like, yeah. <laughs> sorry. And also, I, I could imagine, like, the perfect storm would be the underweight, uh, anemic uh, female who's smoking outside in her, th- in her um, uh, we, in Australia, we call them thongs, but Craig would call them jandals. Ian yeah. would probably yeah. call them flip-flops. Yeah. You could just imagine that that perfect storm. And, and you know, I, I, I have a, a, a my first... Uh, case of chill blains, which was soon after um, you guys contacted me, was a young man who had been um, who had been um, uh, training barefoot tra- running, which I know, Craig, I'm sure, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> you've got a lot to say on that. But um, he, he said, yeah, I've, I've, I've been barefoot uh, training a lot. And now I've got this thing on, you know, on my toe. And what do you know? So, <laughs> and he was underweight and, you know, trying a new, uh, you know, uh, vegan kind of diet. So, you know, it, it's amazing how these things kind of trend and they manifest in different ways. Yeah. Um, uh, we want to get into a bit more of the history and the, some, some of the potentially associated vascular conditions, like we mentioned Raynaud's. But before we do, and just while I think of it, we've talked about risk factors brilliantly here. We've talked about the, the female sex. We've talked about low BMIs. We've talked about smokers. We've talked about known uh, episode of cold exposure but what about those cases where none of those are the case what about um you know the uh, not young or old the middle-aged male who isn't slim myself perhaps who hasn't had any kind of potentially uh, o- obvious cold exposure that immediately comes to mind in the history um why do why are some people who don't have those risk factors getting them and i also know craig's got anecdotes of people that have had them for years and then mm. suddenly report they don't get them anymore so what's What's going on there? It kind of makes sense why someone with risk factors with a cold exposure, you know, or would, would this, this cascade would occur. But what's happening when none of those are present? It would be something systemic, likely. So we mentioned before um, SLE, so systemic uh, lupus erythematosus or things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, Raynaud's, um, Raynaud's is another form of vasospasticity that happens not on a, not on a localized level, but on a, on a general level. So they're both, they're both the same sort of cluster of conditions, but typically Raynaud's is, is secondary to something else. So if you've got someone popping up, you know, with, with no real history or they get a chill blame, let's say in summertime, then there's likely something to be systemic. And that's where you would discuss their medical history Occasionally, um, uh, cryoproteins in particular can be linked with, you know, recent episodes of, um, of viruses. And I and I, I don't necessarily want to give away what Nadia is talking about tomorrow, but COVID is a virus. So I wonder whether that mechanism changes um, changes the way the vasculature works. So if it's if it's a if it's an atypical presentation and an atypical um, history in terms of their age and their risk factors and the season, that's when you need to look a little bit further and, and, and start thinking about why is this here? What, what's happened recently to them? Um, but yeah, those, um, I mean, um, Raynaud's in particular, if you look at the lists of, you know, secondary Raynaud's, so that's Raynaud's as a result of something, it's, you know, a list as long as your arm, there's lots and lots of different causes of it. So yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that also. I think that also the answer to that question also reflects just how much we don't know about this problem, and I think every clinician yeah. will, can relate to patients they have seen who have had chill blains for every year for ten years, and all of a sudden they just stop happening, and you you ask them what happened that year, what was different, did you, you know, like, and you can't narrow it down to anything, but back to your question in about that that sort of age group. 
that not not necessarily at high risk for it. I I, I think like some people to me the, the problem is a change in temperature from cold to warm but some people are so sensitive just going from one room of the house to another room of the house is enough to trigger a chill blain. for other people they've got to be in the freezing cold russian side and stick their foot in front of a heat source <laughs> and they don't get a chill blain. um yeah so i i just think it reflects just how little we really do know about this problem and that's why yeah. there are so many anecdotes yeah yeah and 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 maybe yeah um, also because because the natural history of it is relatively short in most cases, maybe that's also why it hasn't been deeply researched because by the time you actually get enough people, you know, look, because, you know, not everyone gets chill blains. Some people have a very short bout of it. You know, it would be hard to kind of study it in real time um, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's unique and relatively short. Yeah, and, and, and uh, sorry, Craig, go on. Oh, sorry, I just, I just had a question sort of relevant to this, which um, Katrina sort of asked about the photosensitive sunlight. Then she's mentioned they're a client with a strange presentation, celiac query lupus. Well, yes, it is associated with a form of lupus. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, the vascular reactivity is the, you know, so um, yeah. yes, could, it could be, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're all itching excuse the pun um to get into um <laughs> i do i do dental puns chill blame puns i've got a lot uh, we, want, we want to get into the management side of things because that's where yeah. craig that's where we're going to have to put craig's leash on and start when he starts talking about the pseudoscience um but before we do actually a couple of quick things that have just come to mind just so that i'm, I'm aware if there's anyone watching like myself who isn't super comfortable with this they've, they've got the whole the whole clinical picture i want to talk a little bit about you talked about its natural course so i just want to talk in a second about what that looks like um i guess because that that's that then leads into do we leave this thing alone do we do something and if so what do we do but before i do that we've talked about the history we've talked about some of the clues if we've got a patient in front of us that may raise our index of suspicion we've we know now what observations and, and clinical sort of visual manifestations they have what sort of reports do people typically say itching I, I i've heard itching myself uh, quite a few times are they always itchy do they ever report any other specific type of problems is there a night pain is there any other kind of gems that you could give us that may just just flag it for us so itching burning heat tightness um you know those those kinds of classic acute injury kind of things or blistery kind of feeling you know the, the the fresh blister pain you know you've worn that pair of tight shoes you come back it's stingy it's not it's not super super painful um but it's it, it's really irritating that's probably you know it's it's annoying enough for them to see you but not annoying enough for them to freak out basically um and you know it's it, it's just irritated it's irritated and hot i mean if you think about inflammation and itch they're very closely related virtually every type of itch has an inflammatory component so a hot blistery irritated area would would probably be you know the easiest way to go about uh, the the easiest um memory cue for that but also occasionally um speaking of blisters they um a symptom is ulceration so if you've got an unexplained sore which wasn't you know you're wearing good shoes you haven't been walking a lot and then it just pops up so particularly for, for an elderly person or someone who's perhaps neuropathic if, if you've got a random you know ulcer or wound you're like how did that get there it may the the underlying um etiology may be a chill brain so yeah cool Those are the things then, for any 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 24 hour pattern uh, is it is there... they say that they say that but 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 i i think it's I, I think it depends i mean some people it'll pop up very quickly and i think it depends on on how long the cold exposure was and how quickly the reperfusion is i mean so for example if you've gone out for a day in the snow and then you had boots on that were, you know, not necessarily protective, <clears throat> excuse me, and things got a bit wet, then, you know, that night, you you know, when, when you've jumped in the shower, when you've got in front of the fireplace, that night you go, oh, hang on, something's a bit irritated and itchy here. What's going on? Um, and then other people, it'll pop up two or three days later. So normally, normally you, 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 you'd expect to see it within a, 12 to 48 hour period so you know that sort of time frame i'd say but again it's 
it's it's it's personal and it's non-specific. So yeah. It's good to but know. Yeah. For, good to yeah. know for the history, history taking, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, right, Craig. Your favourite bit: the management. We talked about it's. <laughs> we talked about its natural course. I've certainly read literature that says within seven to fourteen days they sort of self resolve. You're nodding. I don't know. You know. Maybe you could expand on that in a second as to what, how accurate that is. But like we've already said, they can go on to ulcerate. So how do we know what to do, when to do it? How, when when do we just leave alone? When when do we treat? I think we'll start there. Before we talk yeah. about what we do, let's talk about when we do it. Okay, so it, it depends on what stage it's at and it depends on their reaction. So if it's at an early stage, um, if the skin hasn't broken down, there's not really too much to do other than supportive symptomatic treatment. But towards the end, or if it's a, a much more acute, um, significant dermatological response, that's when we would treat depending on on what's presenting so if you've got a break in the skin that skin should be protected because you've got skin on top of a vascular injury but if you don't have a break in the skin most of the time it's about reassurance keeping warm monitoring um one one nice um side effect of covid has been telehealth um and you know for a lot of my patients i say to them feel free to send me a photo you know we're, we're all tethered to our smartphones so you know if you take a photo every day and then you know get in touch with me for me i also tell my patients send me photos because it keeps my kids away from my phone but um <laughs> it, it really it really depends on what you see so if if you don't see a break in the skin you don't necessarily need to treat it that skin can still be protected i mean craig mentioned that you know, people use things like Vaseline. While that wouldn't necessarily treat the chill blind, it may protect the skin to some extent. Mm. And um, so it really depends on, on, on what you see. So if, if it's broken skin, treat accordingly. If it's unbroken skin, most of the time you can leave it. There is some evidence for symptomatic relief with a topical corticosteroid. And obviously, you would start with something very, very gentle, like as in a 0.5% or 1% over-the-counter hydrocortisone because steroids cause atrophy. And if you've already got vascular and tissue damage, you wouldn't necessarily want to damage it even further. But that should give symptomatic relief. And I wonder as well whether um, application of a steroid cream twice a day would, would cause some improvement of symptoms simply through massage. And I wonder whether that's yeah, why, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I wonder whether that's why some of the treatments are effective because they effectively you're massaging it. Sorry, Craig. You know, look, just to expand on some of those comments, that the when I first suggested to him we need an episode on chillblains, my motivation for suggesting that was the number of times I was seeing um, colleagues on ask online for advice for treatment for chillblains. And they, they get a lot of advice, everyone, everyone recommending something different, almost none of them evidence-based, and half of them perhaps having no known pathophysiological mechanism by which they would even work. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. I, I thought, wow, this is really, this is, a, but then again, that probably reflects how little we know about this condition. But one thing I've often wondered is that perhaps everything works and it's not what you use, it's the physical rubbing of it is actually... So, so just rubbing a, an emollient in um, is, a, is, is the, it's the physical action actually is what, where the benefit is. But I think, I think it does reflect the, the state of the knowledge that there are so many recommendations, almost none of them evidence-based for its management. And it's, people are saying, oh, I use this, it works brilliantly. Um, but when we know the natural history is it disappears in a week anyway, unless they get another one, <laughs> um, you know, right. so was it the natural history, was it the actual physical rubbing of that useless intervention or was it the actual intervention? And, and that's, that's really what sort of motivated me to suggest to him. We really need an episode on chill lanes. <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, yeah. What you're saying, Craig, is you, you recommend reflexology as a first line. <laughs> That's, that's, no, not re reflexology, a damn good foot rub. Big difference between the two. So is that is that not the same thing? Anyway, so yes. so when when we see when we see, um, I want to talk a bit about the wound mat. You know, if it ulcerates in a minute, because I'm no wound manager. So I want to just expand on that, just in case anyone. When you said if the skin's broken, treat accordingly. I just want to talk about what accordingly means. But mm. when we when we see creams, you know, off over the shelf, um, over the counter creams at the chemist, uh, marketed as chillblain creams. What are they? Are they mild steroids? Are they, are they, are they, I know that nifedipine, you know, are they like um, vasodilators? What, what's in them and, and is there any value to them? 
They're mostly rubifacients. So rubifacients mean warming agents, but whether or not they do enough to the to the deep vasculature, you know, remains to be seen. Most of the time they 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 kind of work on the same pathway that simulates the chilblains to begin with. They they mostly simulate thermoreceptors, so the, the feeling of heat. So that's you've got ingredients like you know menthol, capsaicin, uh, friar's balsam, those kinds of things. But they may have they may have a, a role in preventative. So, if, um, but then again, that's probably because of massage. Anyway, what's interesting is if speaking of rubifacients, if you Google that and if you have a look. Uh, at the uh, Wikipedia page, right down the bottom, it's also, you know, it's got link C also and snake oil comes up. So, <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, do, I, I, do they have value? Mm, don't know. I mean, you know, I, I'd say, again, it, it's probably just symptomatic relief, but yeah. Okay. Um, Actually, Joseph, we just had another comment from Nadia. Um, uh, the uh, heparin, heparin is a popular yeah. agent, you know, and again, I, yeah. I, I could I could see, I, I think if someone, no, I mean, there's no evidence for that, but if someone suggested that, like Nadia is commenting on, there is a, th a reasonable pathophysiological mechanism by which it could work. Yes. In comparison uh, in to fact, a lot of other suggestions yeah. people make. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have, I, in, in fact, I was, I, I mentioned a colleague, uh, a colleague mentioned to me that heredoid, which is heparin yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and 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 that would that probably would make a difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. depending so on could, the stage, of course. Yeah, sorry, we, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Sorry to interrupt. Could we quickly touch on what appropriate yes. man management of ulcer of broken skin? And and I haven't uh, touched a dressing for a decade, yeah. so <laughs> ap apologies in advance if the answer is well, it depends, which it may well be. But is there is there a, a reasonable approach to take? Are there things to do? People reach for the iodine. Is it just a dry dressing? What's what does what does management of a broken chilblain traditionally look like? Well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that. I deserve that. It's, it's the way we unfortunately it's the way it works in wound management. So um, occasionally chillblains can cause secondary bacterial infections. So I, my, my general go-to wound dressing for most chillblains and for um, anything where you've got a slight risk of a secondary infection is to use something like flaminol. I don't know whether you can get flaminol in the UK, but Flaminol comes in two forms, fort and hydro. Flaminol is basically a hydrogel with alginates in it. So it's basically, it's a clear, um, it's a clear um, gel and, and, and it also kills bugs as well. Um, but most of the time, if, it, if it's, let's say, at the end of the blistering stage, it's a little bit raw, just a really simple dressing, a melalin, maybe with a bit of, you can, if, if you want, a bit of, you know, topical antiseptic, betadine would be fine. Um, depending on, on, on how nasty it is. And if you want a bit of cushing, you could put a hydrocolloid on like duoderm. But it depends on what you're seeing. So if it's if it's red and angry, I would use something and, and, and possibly deep, I would use something with an antimicrobial component. But if it's just a bit of extra protection, like a second skin, you'd use something very simple, basically a material-based Band-Aid. So... Yeah, it depends on, depends on what you're seeing. It depends on the depth and depends on the anger. So the more angry, the more dressings. The less angry, the less dressings, basically. And, and any rationale for, I know when many, many years ago in my diabetic wound days, um, you know, with apical lesions, we would often employ some kind of uh, modality to deflect pressure as well, whether it be some kind of, you know, toe prop or whatever. Do they have a yeah. role in, in these kind of lesions? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if, if it hurts them when they walk, then take the pressure off, you know, it's, um, and you know, that could be toe foam, some of the dressings themselves, um, the name escapes me. It's basically an entire foam dressing. You, you literally just pop it over the top. Um, so that can be good. Uh, it, it'll come back to me later. It's a pink dressing. I, I often use it post PNA, TNA, but yeah, felt as well. And, and felt itself will insulate. Um, a colleague of mine, she uses Friars balsam and wraps cotton balls around it like a little cocoon. And that would offload as well, and I imagine that would give symptomatic relief. So, yes, yeah, certainly the, the, the sort of general universal wound management principles apply, but hopefully you're dealing with an acute short-term wound because yes. occasionally if you've got underlying vascular damage, um, a chillblain can precipitate a chronic wound and then 
you've got that whole kind of that that that's its all that's its own pod chat live episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but there's also but there's also the 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 general foot hygiene advice about keeping it warm, all those kinds of issues, avoiding you know if the foot gets cold, warm it up slowly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we don't don't obviously don't neglect that. What about nifedipine orally? Um, the evidence the evidence mostly looks at it um, in preventative um, aspects. So you sort of you start taking it early, but. By the time you, you you build up enough of a vasodilatory concentration, the chill blame would probably be gone. So pers- personally, I mean, I, I've I've never had had a, a case that chronic that I've had to suggest it to a patient. Have, have either of you guys, Craig? I think you mentioned to no. me you. No, look, I, I in these online when people ask for advice, someone always responds with that as an intervention. I yeah. have looked recently looked at two RCTs on it, one showing it worked and one showing it didn't work. <laughs> um, and I, I, haven't, I haven't delved into them, you know, and it could be for the reason that you just said, what, what was the timing of them using it? You know, if they used it like more as a preventative or, or early that maybe the, the, the outcome measure was it didn't recur. So it didn't actually, uh, um, so those kinds of issues um, in there. And so actually someone just, Sharon just did mention something we didn't mention, um, uh, tube foam, tubular foam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like we, we yeah, yeah. It's uh, um yeah, a good absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the, another interesting one I, I have, I, I, I periodically joke with patients, they need to move to Queensland. Do you know, like it's no, just, um, just k- spend the winter in a warmer climate, you know, and yeah. I think well, in your yeah. case, Ian, they'd send them to Spain, wouldn't you, or something? Yeah, yeah. anywhere but here, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but actually, interestingly on that, I, I, I do like tongue in cheek say that to patients, but I did have one recently in which I was actually really dead serious. Like her chill blains were so bad. Uh, they happened every year. They ulcerated. She was on nifedipine. The, everyone had tried everything. She'd been to vascular surgeons. She'd been to everyone. And they, they were causing extraordinary pain for her. And I just really seriously said, I think you need to move to Queensland. And, and I, I mm. meant that quite genuinely. Whereas every other patient, it's a tongue in cheek joke. But <laughs> when they, they do get that bad. And they, they, you know, I was at my wits end as to try, what I could do to help her. No one else could help her. I tried everything I could. It was just mm. that bad. Um, so let me, um, let me try and bring together a, a bit of a clinical summary. I think we're all uh, fairly confident now that if we have a a female with low body mass index who's a heavy smoker who has a, a some kind of pre-existing family history or vascular conditions and a story of cold damp exposure in the previous 72 hours and a lesion that looks like an angry blister and she describes it as itching i think we're all pretty happy now this is we're in chill blame territory um, yeah. we also know that you know it doesn't have to be that clinical scenario for these things to occur and we did talk about if we have someone who's completely the opposite of that it should raise our suspicions as to um, whether there's anything going on that has not yet been identified could you just briefly speak to what our steps in clinic may be then i'm guessing we are talking about onward referral or some kind of escalation somewhere yeah yeah so if it's if it's the opposite case if it's a very healthy 40 year old male who doesn't smoke and, you know, the clinical picture doesn't quite fit, you'd look at perhaps some more vascular studies. You may refer to a rheumatologist to see whether there's something autoimmune going on um, just to get a bigger clinical picture. Um, and, and you know, vascular studies, I I used to be the, the first one to pull out the Doppler and have a look and do an ABPI and have a look at all those things. Now I just say, look, you know, I can only hear what's going on. I can't see what's going on. It's amazing what you can find. And particularly, this is just a general sort of wound management stuff. If you've got a non-healing wound, sometimes just getting something as simple as, you know, a duplex scan, you'll be, oh, hello, there's some sort of blockage there. And sometimes it it can be something local. Sometimes it can be something more systemic that's going on. So, yeah, I think, you know, GP, vascular, rheumatology would be probably – you know, possibly even neuro- neurological. I mean, some people, particularly with Raynaud's, they get sympathectomies. You know, they literally cut out the nerves. Um, so, yeah, those, those uh, the professionals who would deal with those kinds of areas, I would say, would be the way to go if something it doesn't quite fit. Perfect. So looking at my list of all of the, the, the hits I wanted to make sure we covered, Craig, I'm pretty much done. We've, we've yeah. We've, uh, we've we've covered covered all the bases that I wanted to. Is there anything that's come in on the Facebook group? 
No, look, there was, there was hang on, sorry, I'm just going to scroll back. There was one question that's worth any dental, up. Any dental gags or puns? No. <laughs> ah. Yeah. We got one, um, Christine asked earlier on about what, anything to read, any papers, specific papers, and I, I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you go, Joseph. <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 there's lots of them, but they're mostly they're mostly uh, reviews and case series. Um, but there's a lot of them out there, and I, I'm happy to. I, do you guys do a link after the show of, of different yeah, can, things to discuss? We can add links. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I'll so I'll I'll share all the papers that I found. Um, but yeah, not not a whole lot out there, and you know some, and, and and they all admit, look, we don't really understand everything about this. It's theorized, blah 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 blah. So yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think my answer to this. Is the same answer I gave a couple of episodes ago to a similar question. There aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, no. I mean, there, 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 yeah, there is no one. Like, there's no definitive textbook. There's no yeah. you know, one or two definitive papers. But there is a lot being written about them. So you need to get this massive body of literature and try and distill it down. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's and that's probably reflects the state of the knowledge on the problem. That, yeah. That, um, um, I I, uh, I dove into the literature at lunchtime today just so that I didn't make a complete fool uh, fool of jack, jack <laughs> after myself. I like to at least pretend I'm prepared actually, for these things. And uh, taking away the the coronavirus published papers, I found it really difficult to find anything that was in the last twenty years. Like all of the all of the children's papers I was looking at were the nineties. Um, yeah. You know, when you when you got into yeah. the like recent times, it was all as we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, I'm sure that the you know, we've had more probably more papers in the last four months um, published uh, than I, I could find in the last decade. Yeah. Actually, I just remember, and I just take I take back what I just said. There is probably one good reference, and that's the NICE NICE guidelines in the UK, which we can't access from Australia. We're blocked. Um, wow. But that actually is a good summary. Um, of the evidence for all the different interventions, pretty much saying, well, these are the interventions and this is what the evidence for them and there's not much for them. But that, those, I mean, I managed someone, I, get, I, I think it might have been you, in a couple of years ago. I think you got them for me because <laughs> I couldn't access them. <laughs> yeah, but... I'm a dealer uh, like that. I just deal in uh, <laughs> black, black market research. <laughs> big, big, big market. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're the, you know, so yeah, they may not be geo-blocked now, but they were... Um, they only they were obviously UK based guidelines and they blocked them to the UK, but um, perhaps someone could search them. But I, I think a key take home in all of this is, is the, the awareness of the national natural history. Yeah. And yeah. Our, our perhaps limited potential to intervene in that. And that intervention is perhaps only symptomatic because of the itching and the pain. Um, yeah. And probably another take home would be the extraordinary wide range of recommendations made based on anecdotes. Yeah, and 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 to your point about the history, I mean, we as podiatrists, particularly those who deal in dermatology, we love to touch and put things on. So there's this kind of, you know, subconscious urge to do things, you know. And so when a patient comes in and something hurts you, oh, okay, let's put this on. And I wonder how that's how a lot of these anecdotes have developed. Yeah. 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 Makes right. sense. Cool. So, um, I don't. I'm just looking. Um, no, there's no other comments that, that, you know, there, there is a couple here, but you can probably come into the comments later, Joseph, and respond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the only, the I'll, I'll oh, put sorry. up, I'll, I'll, I'll put up a picture of, of, of that dressing. It's just gone right out of my head, but it's, it's, it's snog. It, it's, it's a cute name, Steve. He said, maybe it's called snog. Uh, great name for a dressing. Definitely snogging is one way to keep you warm. <laughs> <laughs> But um, okay. I'll, I'll I'll try to find that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, before we go, we've obviously got to deal with this. Um, the um, this, uh, <laughs> beetroot juice for chilblains that I wrote about, <laughs> um, which is a kind of fun thing to do. I I, I mean, for my, my motivation behind writing about this beetroot for chilblains is I, I came across this article that showed drinking beetroot juice did actually help them improve those with rain arts because there's nitrates in beetroot juice and it's a vasodilator and and beetroot juice is the new superfood you know run all it's all over the running magazine so i was sort of you're starting to tune into beetroot juice being as a superfood and then i thought um oh i wonder how long before the cranks start recommending beetroot juice for chilblains so six months go by and i did a google search and no one was recommending it so i thought oh well i'll i'll, I'll. the point of my blog post was to to look at how um cranks start recommending 
you know, natural interventions for things based on quite spurious links. But it, the Romans apparently used beetroot juice on chilblains. I managed to find that, which was I thought was quite quite interesting. That that it's not mm. new. You know, I can't claim any credit for being the first to suggest it now. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but Craig, there's a there's a commercial opportunity. Payne's uh, chillblain beetroot magic or something. You know. <laughs> well, that's supposed to help you make run, make you run, help you run faster too. Yep, yep, um, yep. So it, it's probably worth a try. So, um, look, I think we I think we've we've come to an end. There's been no more comments. So look, so thanks so much, Joseph. I, you know, I know it's early in the morning for you and me. Um, so I always, yeah. always appreciate when anyone from Australia gets up for one of these early ones. Um, yeah. We before this episode started, we probably had more interest in this episode than than any of the others. Um, looking at the number of people watching this live, we're we're pretty close to double our average. Um, so we, it's, it's been, you know, there's obviously a lot of interest in this topic and I think Ian and I continue to be surprised how much interest there, there are in topics that we're not necessarily interested I, in. I, I will, I, 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 when Craig first contacted me, as, as he often does in the middle of the night and said, we need to do an episode on X, Y, Z. And I'm like, oh, here we go. He said, we need to do an episode on chill blains. And I, I, I just can't repeat what I said. I was like, <laughs> and to, to, to hear these stats. You know, when when other topics that I think are amazing and fascinating, not that this isn't, Joseph, you've made it, you've owned it. No, don't get me wrong. Thank but, you. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it never. Yeah, Craig and I have always surprised that that the ones that, that we never never too sure are going to do well seem to absolutely crush it. So yeah, um, thank you, thank you so much for getting up so early and, and entertaining us with it. It's brilliant. Pleasure, yeah. pleasure, pleasure. And um, I'll I'll add those links, and uh, hopefully it'll keep the discussion going. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks, okay, guys. It's been yeah, fun. Thanks again, and look, for those that have just joined, I know a lot of people have joined late. Come back to Facebook in 10, 15 minutes. The whole video will be there. It'll be up on YouTube in a few hours, and the podcast version will be available. So thanks so much, Joseph. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening.